Can you hear me now? Do I have to have this thing pretty much pressed to my lips? Okay. Okay, before I begin, I want to uh, point something out that's very important to keep in mind for the next hour and a half that I'm going to be talking, or the next however long I'm going to be talking. I do not work for Microsoft. I'm not a representative of Microsoft. I'm sitting here telling you what I know about locking down your Windows 2000 box. You just installed Windows 2000 server. Now what? Okay, this is not the Microsoft official slant. I'm not, uh, I just want to really emphasize I don't work for Microsoft and I'm in no way trying to uh, indicate that I represent them in any way, shape, or form. Okay, this is one man's opinion. Um, a little bit of background. First of all, my name is Keith Nugent. I didn't put that on the slide, but my name is Keith Nugent. Uh, I work in Chicago, Illinois as a uh, trainer. I train people how to set up Windows 2000, NT, Cisco, that sort of stuff. I'm the t a type of person that when your boss tells you you're going to a class, I'm the guy standing in front of you. Okay? Um, I teach everybody from people that don't even know what a computer is. They have to learn how to turn it on all the way up to they've been doing this for 20 years and now they just need to learn the next operating system or how to configure the Cisco router that they just had shipped in. Okay. The topic, how to lock down your Windows 2000 boxes. Again, this is, you just ordered a uh, server or you just installed a server, you just threw Windows 2000 on there. How does it come by default? What it, uh, are some of the options you have to lock things down to kind of secure things and what can we do to lock them down even further? Okay. By default, Windows 2000, NT, the whole uh, product line has never been ultimately secure. You can't just install Windows 2000, walk away. You couldn't install NT and just walk away and expect that nobody is going to be access, able to access any of your data. Okay? But we do have some options. We can lock things down and keep people out. You have to have uh, the operating system plus a little bit of intelligence and just go in and work with it. So we're going to take a look at default NTFS permissions. We're going to talk briefly about what NTFS is, how it works, what you need to have it installed. I imagine everybody here already knows what NTFS is, but I'm going to just give a, a brief recap for those of you who may have some misgivings about it or who may not know about it. We're then going to talk about what are the default settings as far as the security templates and uh, locking down of settings on Windows 2000 Professional. Then we'll talk about default server, and we'll talk about server, server advanced server data center server. They're all just different capabilities. The security is going to be the same on them uh, as far as the default settings. And the default domain controller settings. You may be surprised at the uh, security by default on a domain controller. I'm sorry? Um, I'll make the slides available. Uh, I'll talk to the guys that are running this, or I'll put them up on my website. I'll figure out some way to make them available. But to be honest with you, I've only got like 10 slides. So there's going to be a lot of demonstrations with actually showing you rather than doing it with slides. So starting off with NTFS permissions, by default, NTFS gives everyone full control of almost every file on the operating system. The C drive at the root of C, everyone full control. If you take a look at... Take a look at the properties of C. It's just everyone full control. Anybody can do whatever they want by default at the C drive. Okay, obviously this isn't a great idea. Well, maybe that's an understatement. But that's the default. That's where we start off. Okay? Nobody's saying that this is the most secure way of doing things. It's just that start off with a blank slate and then you can lock things down from there. Okay, so here we see everyone full control. For those of you, okay, first of all, how many people are working with NT right now or have worked with NT in the past? How many people are working with 2000 already? How many people have been working with 2000 for over a year? Okay, you probably know a lot of what I'm going to be talking about if you've been working with it for over a year, but uh, maybe I've got some stuff that you don't know. Okay, so this is the Windows 2000 uh, properties dialog box, security dialog box. Um, a couple things about uh, security. With 2000, now we have allow or deny. You can either allow or deny the specific types of permissions. And of course, NTFS permissions. NTFS permissions, there's uh, about 15 or 20 actual permissions. These are accumulated into the cumulative permissions or the uh, standard permissions. So the ones that we're seeing here are actually standard permissions. These are cumulative of the actual NTFS permissions. If I to click on advanced here and go in and edit the everyone group here, 
we can see we have a bunch of other permissions as well. Another cool, uh, cool thing about 2000, what's uh, kind of new about NTFS, is now you can say, OK, where do I want this to apply to? Do I want this to apply to this folder only, this folder, subfolders and files, which is the default for everything, this folder, any subset of there, so folder and subfolders, folder and files, subfolders and files, just subfolders, just files, uh, et cetera. In case you can specify, I want this to propagate to a certain extent. I'm going to leave it with that. And you can see here, if I go back, I want to apologize, this mouse is kind of difficult to control with one hand, but. If I want to give somebody permission, add in. Now, the first thing you're going to do, how many people have everyone full control still on their machines now, on their servers? OK, yeah, I didn't think so. First thing you're going to do is remove the everyone full control. And at the very least, if you want, still want to give everybody full control, go in and there's a group called Authenticated Users. That's people that you've allowed to authenticate against this machine or against this domain, if you're operating in a domain environment, which you probably will be with a number of servers. Go in and uh, specify authenticated users and give them full control. Then somebody can't just walk in with a box, plug into your network, and start looking at the files. Everyone is just anybody that has access to the server. Okay, everyone means everyone. So I'm going to go in and I'll just add in guests here for this demonstration because it doesn't really matter. I'm going to give the everyone, by default they get read and execute, uh, list folder contents and read. I'm just going to give them read permission. We'll see what read permission is when we go in a little bit further. Oh, also, as I go along here, if you have any questions, feel free to ask questions throughout or I'll, of course, reserve some time at the end uh, for questions. But I know oftentimes I get a question in my head and I don't remember it an hour later when it's time for questions. So here we see the default permissions are going to uh, actually be, or the, the cumulative permission of read gives us list folder, read data, read attributes, read extended attributes, read permissions. And I believe that's it. Yeah, that's it. OK, so anytime you add in a permission, anytime you give somebody permission, what you're actually doing here is giving them a group of actual NTFS permissions. OK, you'll also notice on this advanced box down here, there's a uh, reset permission on all child objects to enable propagation of inheritable permissions. What this means is when I set these permissions, I want this to inherit down to all of the child objects. OK, so if I go in and I set permission on the C drive under NT4, what happened? I had that permission set on the C drive, right? Now if I go in and set something on the C drive, if, let me drill down a little bit here on my C drive. We'll go to program files just for fun. And we'll see if we click on everyone here where the heck is it? There's no everyone. OK, everyone's not on the program files. That was a bad choice of example. OK, here we see everyone. And I don't know if you guys can, yeah, it shows up pretty well there. These are grayed out. I can't uncheck these boxes. These are inherited permissions. So anytime you see gray checkbox and they're pissing you off, because you can't uncheck them. They're inherited from a parent folder. You have to go back and find the parent folder. If you don't want the parent information to be inherited down, just uncheck that, and it's going to give you a dialog box. Do you want to copy these permissions? In other words, right now what we have is the C drive is where the permissions are set, and they're being inherited at the project level. I'll get you in just set one second. Uh, they're being inherited at the uh, projects level, the projects folder level. Do I want to copy those and have those in, uh, apply directly at the projects level, or do I want to remove them, or did I accidentally click on that checkbox and cancel? So I'm going to go ahead and say remove here, and I will see that we don't have anything. If I click on add here, then I can add in permission, and I'm going to cancel out of this so that doesn't actually apply. Yeah, go ahead. And speak up if you want. I'm deaf. Authenticated users is going to be at the domain level. Users is uh, sort of a backward compatibility. It's still there from NT4. Authenticated users indicates a uh, user that currently has uh, the credentials authenticated ju doesn't just present the uh, credentials at the uh, time of access. I don't know if I explained that very well. Basically, authenticated users is the Windows 2000 version of users. It's a little bit more secure. 
because that user has a uh, session or a uh, an authenticated uh, token. token. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. That's a good question. You've got allow and deny. If you check allow, you're explicitly allowing them to have that permission. If you uncheck allow and you do not check deny, you're implicitly denying them that permission. Okay? What that means is that it's because you're not allowing them, then you're denying them. Okay? However, if they have permission somewhere else that allows them, then they will be allowed. So implicit denial by not checking that just means if nowhere else says that they have permission, then they don't have permission. If you allow them anywhere else, then they're allowed. If you check the de deny checkbox, then you're explicitly denying them. Even if they have allow somewhere else, they're not going to be able to get in because deny overrides allow every time. It's the way that the uh, access control list is set up. The denies are up at the top and it parses through. It finds a deny and says, okay, yeah, never mind. Does that answer your question? Great. Okay. That was a good question. So getting back to the slides, everyone full control by default. You need to be using NTFS to set permissions at all. Now that may seem a little uh, uh, basic, but I've had people uh, come up to me and, oh, you know, my server is uh, pissing me off because everybody can go in and modify files, and I go and they're running fat. And I'm like, well, what about your NTF? I asked them about NTFS permissions. Yeah, I went in on a change of permissions. They were changing their share folder permissions and didn't understand why somebody sitting at that box was able to modify the information. So you have to be using the NTFS file system in order to be able to use NTFS permissions. Okay, we just took a look at how to set NTFS permissions. You can go into My Computer or into Windows Explorer. You right click, you go to uh, Property Security add the user and then specify what level of permission you have. You can specify the permission either at the cumulative level or the standard permission saying read, and that's going to give them the actual NTFS permissions, or you, or you can go into advanced and specify the individual permissions that you want to grant them. Okay. And then uh, what's new about NTFS permissions? They're inheritable. I can go in and uh, specify uh, everyone full control, the uh, C drive, and that's going to propagate down to everybody else. If I uncheck that, it's going to, uh, at a lower level, if I say do not allow inheritable permissions, then I apply those permissions directly at that subdirectory. Go ahead. I'm sorry? Yes, that's true. Yeah, that sounds right to me. I've uh, I've not uh, done much with the null user account. I generally do training, so that's uh, quite possibly the actual answer. Okay. Um, this is showing you the same screens that I already showed you. Uh, you can either allow, deny. If it's a white checkbox with a check mark in there, it's inherited. I'm sorry, it's allowed. If it's a white checkbox without the checkmark in there, it's, then it's not specified. If it's gray, that means that it's inherited from a higher level, okay, from a uh, parent directory of some sort. Uh, click on Advanced, and you can go in. You can click on uh, Edit, View Edit to look at these, or you can add in here. So you can either add at the previous screen, add somebody in and add in the, uh, with the standard permissions, or you can go to this screen, add in, and add uh, that user in with... Uh, specific NTFS permissions, the actual permissions. And then when you uh, click on that, you can go in and specify where you want that to apply, this folder, subfolders, files, or any combination thereof. Okay. Getting into the uh, default security settings, default security settings are actually pretty lax. NTFS permissions, I'm not really going to go into, but uh, basically everyone full control of the C drive, the WinNT, the program files are a little bit less uh, wide open. Uh, they go to authenticated users. Administrators are the only ones that can do real uh, modification under WinNT. You've got a 42-day password expiration for local accounts. Does everybody understand the difference between a local account and a domain account? Does anybody not understand the difference there? Okay, a local account is on the local machine. On It's stored in the SAM database, Security Accounts Manager database, on that local machine. If I have an account on machine A and I want to access resource on machine B, if I'm using my account from machine A, I can't get that, that resource on machine B. That account is stored locally on that machine. A domain account is stored at a domain control. It's actually stored in Active Directory for Windows 2000. 
is in uh, and you authenticate from your local machine against the domain controller. So you have domain credentials. If you want to access a resource on machine B, if you're using a domain account, basically both machines are trusting that domain controller for authentication. So therefore, you can access a resource there. Okay. For the local account, for the one that only applies to this machine, you've got a 42-day pa password expiration. It's going to, by default, send uh, LM and NTLM responses. Um, not going to uh, go to NTLM v2 or Kerberos by default. And most of the settings, when you look at the security templates, are either not defined or they're disabled. It's pretty wide open. You have to, it's, they're relying on you to go in and actually secure these things. Server, still pretty wide open. It's going to do basically the same thing, 42-day password. Uh, LM and NTLM responses, most settings not defined or disabled. It's not real different from 2000 Professional. Now, you'd expect, when we go to the domain controller, You'd expect the domain controller security would be higher, but it's actually lower. Okay, the machine-specific settings are even more lax than server and professional. There's no uh, password restrictions as far as uh, the 42-day password length. Um, it's not going to specify to uh, send, uh, or actually, it does specify LM and NTLM only. Uh, most everything is defined for a domain controller at the group policy level. We'll talk about group policy in just a couple minutes here. Okay, so security for domain controllers is not controlled at the actual machine. It's controlled for all the domain controllers in general in Active Directory specified in group policy. Okay. So now we're going to take a look at the security settings. Where do you set these secu the security settings? How can you enhance the security settings? How can you increase the level of security using default security templates? Okay, these can be applied to individual machines or applied to group policy. Microsoft provides you with a group of uh, templates that are uh, pretty general, general use, uh, but they're a good way to get started. And then you can also create your custom security templates by either taking those default security templates and modifying them and saving them as your own template, or you can create a brand new template all your own. We're going to take a look at these templates, how to create them, and how to use them. Okay. Um, the security templates, what you do is you go into an MMC, and I'm not going to go into uh, the MMC right now. I've already created one. Does everybody know how to uh, open up MMC and add in snap-ins? Okay, I may not know how to do that. Okay, um, if I get a chance later on, I'll go through how to uh, add in the MMC. Uh, but for right now, let me just show you the one that I created. And I apologize for everything running low. This is a really old laptop. I think it's like a uh, 200 with 32 mega RAM, and I've got advanced server running on here, so things will be a little bit slow. Okay. So here I added in the security template snap-in. The templates are actually stored under CWinNT security uh, templates. You can go into your uh, directory and find those. And here we just have basic templates. I'm going to take a look at the basic domain controller template. The way these templates work is that you have all of the settings, you can go in and uh, modify in the group policy or on the local security on the machine, all these different settings. The idea here is we've taken a database and we've applied these settings to that database. You can then take and apply that database. Say, okay, take all the settings from this database and apply them to the group policy or apply them to the local machine. So you can set all the settings independent of the machine and then apply that te template over and over and over again to different machines or to multiple group policies so that you get the exact same level of security across everywhere. Okay, so I'm going to take a look at the basic DC. Um, I'm going to walk over and point at uh, this one. For those of you that see that, uh, you may want to divert your eyes over here. You've got basic domain controller, basic server, and basic workstation. Those are roughly, roughly equivalent to the default security that's applied when you first install a professional server or you upgrade to a domain controller, okay? They're not exactly identical. There's a couple things that are different that aren't important right now, but basically if you have really gone in and hosed your security, you can apply these basic templates and that'll bring you back to the way it was roughly the day you installed the operating system. Go ahead. Actually, if you are, yeah, you can do that. And if you upgrade from NT to 2000, in other words, you don't do a fresh install, when you upgrade, it's going to presume that you already have the security in place that you want and therefore will not apply the default security templates. In that case, if you want to bring those up to the default Windows 2000 level, then you'd also have to apply these basic templates. 
Okay, so either A, you've just gone over to NTFS from uh, FAT or FAT32 and you want to apply it, or you've really ho hosed your security, or uh, you've upgraded from NT to 2000. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? In other words, you go, out, you go in and modify your security and you want to uh, make that into a template? Yes, yes. If you've gone in and modified it from the basic, from the default, if you made any changes to your security, you can then export that to a template so you can always go back to that level, wherever you uh, got yourself to, okay? So uh, we've got our basic uh, server, workstation, and domain controller. We then have secure uh, workstation and server, and high sec DC and high sec WC, or uh, WS workstation, okay? And we'll uh, cover each of those in a little bit of uh, detail here. But let me just take a look at basic DC to see, uh, we'll take a look at how these are set. Okay, password policy, not defined for anything. Account lockout policy, not defined for anything. Kerberos policy, not defined for anything. You guys see in a pattern here? Okay. If we go in and expand high sec DC, these are the default templates that are included. And again, you can modify these, create your own templates, and then apply your own templates. In fact, if anybody goes in and installs Windows 2000 and then just says, okay, well, I'm just going to apply the high sec DC and that'll do everything that I need. I'll be really disappointed in you, okay? Everybody has different needs. Everybody has different uh, requirements for their server. Yeah, go ahead. What's the password must be less requirements I'm sorry? What That's a good question. I don't know the specific answer. However... It has to include all of those? Okay. Two of three? Okay, I knew that it had to do uppercase, lowercase, uh, alphanumeric characters. What's that? It's three out of four? Okay, it has to have three out of four of uh, uppercase, lowercase, numeric, and special characters. Okay. So it has to have three out of uh, the four so that you don't have users using password for their password. Okay, or if they do, they've got like capital P, password, and then a number, and then a special character, I guess, which is still a lot more secure than just the word password. So I always tell people when they're uh, when uh, I'm telling users how to create passwords, or I'm telling my friends how to create passwords, I tell them to think of their favorite song, think of the first letter from each word in the lyric of that song, and then throw a number in the middle. Okay, that way they're going to remember the password real easy, but it's not going to be as crackable as you know the name of their dog or whatever. Okay, but uh, password requirements and good password guidelines are the subject of an entirely different speaker, so uh, I'll leave those alone for right now. Okay. So password policy for high sec DC, we see it's going to remember 24 passwords, meaning that you can't just change your password back to the exact same password. You have to go through 24 passwords before you can reuse uh, password. It still has a 42 days. Minimum password age, two days. So you can't change it and then change it right again. Minimum password length is eight characters. Passwords must meet complexity requirements enabled. The store password using reversible encryption uh, is disabled. Okay, good. No, if the uh, help desk changes it, what you're going to do is you're going to give them permission to go in and reset password. That doesn't account against the user's changing of their password. Right. You can check that. They can go in and reset the password and then check the checkbox that says user must change password and next logon, in which case they'll be forced to change the password to something different than that. So, yeah, that's not a concern as far as I've seen. I haven't seen that error, but if you, you are seeing that error, then yeah, I guess you'd have to go in and disable that ability. 
Okay. What's that? He was asking if the, uh, we ch set the password so you can't change, you have to wait two days before you pa uh, change it. What happens if the help desk goes in and changes the password? And then the user has to change their password. Again, the user can't just go in and change their password from what the help desk set it to because they've got to wait two days. Okay, I'm pretty sure if you set it to uh, the checkbox, but I may be wrong. Yeah, he was saying that it gives them an error when the user goes in and tries to change the password after uh, help desk has set it. Is What was that? Is it a Win9 Xbox? No. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm not sure what's causing that. I'm sorry. Okay, so you can see this is a little bit more secure than the basic DC. It's setting some actual passwords account lockout policy, still a little bit lax. Um, five invalid logon attempts. The account lockout duration is zero, though. Uh, the reset account lockout counter after 30 minutes. So if you try five times, and you get it wrong, it's going to lock you out for zero seconds. And if you try four times, it's going to wait 30 minutes and then give you another five tries. So still not the most secure, but it's better than nothing. Okay. Kerberos policy is not defined uh, because you have to actually have to have it using Kerberos across the whole system before uh, Kerberos policies would really make much sense. I'm not going to go through the settings on all of these. Uh, this is something that you can just sit down at your server and walk through the uh, MMC snap in and look at the different settings. However, if I have high sec DC, and I like that, okay, I'm going to go in to my password policy and say 42 days just doesn't sit well with me. So I'm going to go in and change this to 41 days because that's all right. Okay. Obviously, you'd make a lot more dramatic change than that, but this is just for demonstration purposes. I can then go in and say save as. I can either say save, and if I specify save right there, then what that's going to do is save high sec DC with these new settings. So it's going to modify my default template. If I don't want to modify the default template, if I want to leave that alone, I can say save as and just give it a different name. Okay, so I'll name this high sec DC2. Now, if I want to apply that template, I can apply either one of those templates, high sec or high sec, uh, high sec DC or high sec DC2, and they've got different settings. So I can go in and modify. Basically, okay, I've got this template. It's doing most of what I want, but I want to make a couple changes. You can go in and do that. Or you can go to security templates. Actually, I think you've got to click here and right click. I hate these context menus. Say new template, give it a name. I'll name it lock everyone out. I can put in a description there if I want to. It'll appear, the description appears over here on the side. I would recommend putting a description in there, even if you know what it's for. It's good to have a description because then everybody else knows what it's for too. Okay, now it's creating a template, and this template is going to be absolutely blank. So I go into my lock everyone out. Everything is disabled or everything is not set, not defined. So you've got to go in and set every setting there. So you can either create a brand new template, absolutely fresh, and go in and set the settings that you want, or you can take a, uh, a template that already exists, either a Microsoft default template or one that you've created in the past, and modify that and then save that as a new template. So you can create these new templates. Okay. Now, how do we actually apply these templates? Well, there's a couple different ways. If you want to apply it directly to the machine, Then you can go into local security policy on the machine. Import policy. Click on import policy. It asks me which template I want to import the policy from. I'll specify one, and then I'll import it. Okay, I'm not going to do that right now because that would screw up the security on the machine, although it wouldn't really matter, and I'll explain why it wouldn't matter in just a moment here. But I could go in and just uh, click on open here. It would apply this template to the local machine. Okay. The other way to do this is to go into a group policy and apply the group policy, or you can go into our tool.
And in the MMC, you can add in security configuration and analysis. There's a command line version of security configuration and analysis tool. The command line version is called SecEdit. Okay, so you can use SecEdit. It's a command line version of this tool. It actually gives you greater uh, functionality than the graphical tool. But for the most part, day-to-day -day operation, operations, the graphical tool will do you pretty good. Okay, so we've got security configuration and analysis. What we're going to do here is we're going to uh, go in and say, okay, I've got my current security. I want to take a look at how this template is going to affect that. Okay, how many people think that just applying everything without testing is a good idea? Yeah, me neither. So you want to test this. You want to see what's going to happen beforehand. This isn't actually testing. It's just configuration or it's just analysis. So I'm going to say open database. I'll give it a new database name. Say open. This is an empty database. The next thing it's going to do is ask me which template I want to apply. Okay. Down here at the bottom, if I've already used this template before, I can say clear this database before importing. So wipe everything fresh. Or I can uh, take a, or an already existing database that I've applied one template to and apply another template on top of that. Because this is a brand new database, I don't have to clear it because it's already clear. So I'll ha uh, add in HiSec DC2 the one that we just modified. And what's going to happen here is just about nothing. Okay, You can't really see any difference. But now what it allows us to do is go in and say, analyze computer now or configure computer now. I'm going to analyze computer now. Ask me, where, I want, where do I want to store the log? By default, it's going to store it in the local administrators or the, the person that's logged on uh, temp location. So we'll say, OK. It goes in and creates it pretty quickly. And now I can breeze through here, take a look at account policies, password policy. And here I have a whole bunch of red X's. Red X means they don't match. Okay, This isn't going to tell you whether it's a good idea or a bad idea. Just, hey, it doesn't match. So enfor enforce password history. Database setting, 24 passwords remembered. The computer is one password. So obviously that's going to be much more secure when we add in this uh, template. Maximum password age, 41 days versus 42 days. They don't match. Actual computer setting is theoretically more secure, cause, or actually less secure, I guess, because it's 42 days as opposed to 41 days. Minimum password age, we can see that w why we have the red X's. Down here with the green check mark, they're both disabled. Green check mark means they match. Okay, so red X means they don't match, green X means they do match. And then if you don't have a red X or a green check mark, then that means that one of them is not set, one of them is not defined. So we come down here to Kerberos policy where uh, the database is not defined, but the computer already has things defined. We don't see anything here as far as a red X or a green check mark. So you've got to watch out for the red X's and something that doesn't have anything because this one's not defined, so it's not actually going to apply anything over this. So it'll still have this. But if the database had some uh, settings that you didn't like but you were already not defined on your machine, it wouldn't show you a red X. It would just be a blue. So don't just go breezing through here looking for red X's. You need to look at each setting by itself. But the red X, the green check mark, or uh, nothing covering the little blue bits on the white page. Um, all indicate how the settings are, so you can look at it at a glance and know how they're going to match up. The next thing that I could do here is if I went in and, oops, right click on here, I could now say configure computer now. This is go now going to apply this template to the uh, system. It's now going to uh, put these settings in effect on the system. Now, here's the thing. If I go in and configure the computer now, it's still not going to do a darn thing to my system. The reason for that is that this is a domain controller in my own little domain. Domain controllers don't get their security or don't get their final say on security from the local settings. They get it from a group policy. Okay, How many people have worked with group policy before this point? Okay. Group policy takes what we had in NT4 with our... Uh, uh, policies, our security policies in NT4, and kind of jacks them up a little bit. You can do a lot more in here. So I'm going to take a look at Active Directory Users and Computers. Actually, you know, let me get through some of these slides first. 
So we've got our security templates that we already took a look at that. Group policy, we'll take a look at order of processing. How does uh, group policy process? The order of the uh, containers and then modifying the default application of group policy. Group policy may not apply the way you want by default. You can go in and modify a lot of this. There's a lot of uh, chance to modify how things go in Windows 2000. So let's take a look at Active Directory users and computers. I'm going to look at my domain controller, OU, and click on group policies. Everybody see how I got there? Active Directory using computers tool. I went to the domain controllers, OU, and then uh, properties. Now I'm going to group policy, and now I'm going to edit this group policy. Now I'm looking at the domain controller default group policy. This is what's applied by default. All I've done on this machine, I installed Windows 2000. I installed PowerPoint so I could show the slides, and I uh, promoted it to a domain controller. Oh, and I installed DNS too so it could be a domain controller. So this is basic default out-of-the-box server configuration. Okay. Um, if we go oops, go into computer window settings, under security settings, this is where I'm going to apply my security. This is where we're going to find our account policies, our local policies, uh, such as password policy and account lockout, local policies, such as audit, user rights assignment. This is something that really screwed me up about two years ago, a year and a half or two years ago, when I was first figuring out Windows 2000 is that you used to just go in and assign somebody their uh, right to log on locally in NT4. You just go to uh, user uh, manager, go to user rights, and then set it up. This is buried within the domain controller group policy under uh, window settings, security settings, local policies, user rights assignment. This is where you go in and give somebody the ability to log on locally. Okay. And as you can see here, we've got TS Internet user, I user Freedom 1. Freedom 1 is the name of my computer. Administrators, backup operators, account operators. Um, most of the default administration security groups and then our Internet users. So by default, on the domain controller, all of our Internet users, our uh, Internet uh, guest accounts, have the right to log on locally to the computer. This is because IIS is installed on Windows 2000 by default, but you would think that domain controllers really shouldn't have that ability. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry? Oh, right, yeah, the Kerberos settings settings uh, for the domain controller by default are stronger than the uh, default template, the uh, basic template. Okay. Okay. So for uh, IIS, you have to have the ability to log on locally for your uh, temp accounts. But you may want to go in and remove these on your domain controllers because you're probably not going to be running your web server off your domain controller, or at least I hope you're not. Okay, so that's one thing that you uh, want to take a look at for log on locally. They can also log on as a batch job because that's what they need to be able to do. Okay, this is where you assign your user rights within the domain. To assign user rights on the local machine, you go to a similar setting, user rights assignment under local policies on the local security policy. Okay, so this goes in and sets uh, your user rights for the domain, and they have to be set at the domain if you're a member of the domain. So if you want to be able to log on to a domain controller, you go to the domain controller in order to log on locally. Okay. Generally, you don't want a lot of people being able to log on locally to the domain controller, though, right? I mean, you're not going to have everybody working on domain controllers. That should be locked away, and just a couple of the administrators going in and working on that. Okay, so this is our domain controller security settings uh, set in the group policy for the domain controller. Group policy objects. A group policy object in Windows 2000 is stored in Active Directory. It's actually uh, made up of two uh, different components. Your group policy object is made up of the group policy container and the group policy template. The group policy container is the actual object in the Active Directory database. Uh, this is uh, basically the pointer, provides version information, et cetera, et cetera. Your group policy template is stored in the sysval directory, and it has all the actual settings of the group policy. Okay? So with your group policies, your group policy information, the meat of it, is stored in the sysval directory, whereas a pointer is stored in Active Directory, so you can link uh, the group policy, the actual uh, settings, to specific users, specific computers, et cetera, within the domain. Okay. So if you drill down through your sysval, sysval directory uh, under the uh, NW, or the name of your domain, 
you'll find the uh, group policy template. The group policy template is named after the 128-bit GUI D uh, that recognize it as a unique object. So when you drill down, you're not going to have domain control or GPO as the name. It's going to be a 128-character uh, uh, GUI D as the name. Okay. And the way that group policy happens, or the way the group policy is applied, is first, it's uh, nearest or it's uh, furthest to nearest, with the exception of the computer. So first, any computer settings are applied when the machine is booting up. It's then going to look for a site based group policy. So any group policies that are applied at the site are applied next to this. It then moves down to the domain level. Anything that's applied at the domain will apply to this user or computer. And then it moves down to the OU. Within the OUs, the organizational units can be nested within each other. If the organizational units are nested within each other, then the parent OU applies and then moves on down the line until you get to the OU nearest to the user or computer that's applying to. For this reason, the local security that's set on your domain controllers, when you go in and set it locally on each individual machine, that's applied first. And then the site generally uh, doesn't matter. Uh, you're not going to apply a lot of group policies at the site level. But anything that's set at the domain level will apply next. And then the set at the domain controllers OU will override those settings. So by the time you get down to the domain controllers OU, a lot of your settings have been modified from whatever you set on the local machine. Therefore, if you go in and modify settings on the local machine, and then you don't see them actually pop up on that machine, this is why. It's because the group policy uh, security settings are overriding the local security settings. Okay. okay. Now, group policy is going to apply differently over a slow uh, network connection. It can detect a slow network link. It uses an algorithm. If you want to know about that algorithm, you can go to the Microsoft website. They have a white paper. Uh, that details how that algorithm, algorithm is used. Basically, sends different, different size packets and sees, uh, looks for the response time. Determine whether a link should be considered slow. If it's considered slow, then all that's going to be applied are, is the security and the administrative templates. So even if you've got a slow link, any security that you set at the group policy level is still going to be processed over that slow network connection. Okay. This is good because the security is always going to be applied to the users. This is bad because it's going to take them an hour and a half to log in if you're not uh, careful with how you set how many uh, uh, GPOs you apply to an individual user or computer and how slow their link is. Okay. Grip policy is going to set a flag that will indicate uh, this will link to the client-side extensions. The client-side extensions will then only process the security and the administrative templates, only the things that are uh, turned on by default over slow network connection. Okay. Now, what happens if you have a conflict between group policy settings? Actually, I uh, talked about that briefly in this slide here, but all group policy settings apply unless there are conflicts. So if I, set, if I have a group policy that says uh, the uh, run command should not be allowed on the user desktop, and then I have another group policy that says that password complexity uh, should be enforced or should be enabled, then both of those are going to apply because there's no conflict. There's two different settings. Okay, so you don't have to have, it's not like one group policy overwrites everything about the other group policy. Uh, it'll only, there, only if there's a conflict between the, uh, the same setting between two different group policies. The last setting process applies in the way that they're uh, applied in order is from bottom to top within the container. So first the, uh, con the computer's local security is going to be applied. Then the site. If there's more than one group policy at the site, bottom to top as, and how they're listed at the site level. You'll then move on to the domain, bottom to top, as they're listed at the domain container. And then each OU, bottom to top within each OU, if you have more than one GPO. If you don't have more than one GPO, obviously it's the only one, so it's the one that's going to be applied. Okay. Right. The reason for that is the one that's on top is the one that's actually going to have the final say. So it processes them bottom to top. Okay. And you can reorder those in the way that they're uh, linked. Um, Actually, here, let me show you that real quick. Oops. If you go into, he was asking, even if uh, there's one that's more restrictive, why is it going to process bottom to top? Okay, here I've got multiple, I'll create a new domain, new OU here, or GPO, I'm sorry. Um, so I've got my two GPOs here. 
This new one doesn't have any settings in it. The default domain controller has some settings in it. What it's going to do is process this one first. When it's done processing this one, it'll move to the one right above it. Okay. The reason for this is the one that's on top is the one that's going to be final. If I wanted to change the order of these, I just click on up here and reorder them. Okay. Let me close out of this. And anytime there's a uh, conflict for a setting, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No. No, you've got to have your uh, your security settings uh, or your uh, group policies for 9x, um, and then you've got to have the ones for 2000. Actually, if you're uh, using NT, 9x, and 2000 clients, you still have to use the uh, policy editor for 95, the one for NT, and then group policy for 2000. Okay. Now, the cool thing is the 2000 will apply or will process the ones for NT, so you don't have to go in and do group policy right away if you've just got a couple of uh, 2000 clients. Okay, they'll still process uh, the NT stuff. It's just that if you want to go to group policy, we're going to do a slowly move everything over as you move your clients over to 2000. Um, but if you're still going to have 95, 98 clients, a lot of people are probably going to still uh, stay with the policy editor, or the uh, group policy from uh, 9X and uh, NT. Yeah, go ahead. Then you're still going to use the, the, the policy, the NT policies. Yeah, unless you've got a 2000 domain controller, you can't use group policy. Okay. Um, and if there's any, con any, any time that there's a conflict between a setting that's intended for a computer and a setting intended for a user, then the uh, computer setting is going to apply. Okay, there's some things that you can uh, apply to both users and uh, computers with group policy. Uh, the computer setting is going to win over uh, the user setting anytime there's any uh, that conflict. Before we move on to questions, there's a couple other things that I wanted to demonstrate. Okay. I told you the slides were short. Okay, and actually here, let me... I'm demonstrating this on the uh, default domain controller uh, GPO. But this, these sort of settings are available in every GPO. You can go into your uh, computer setting under administrative templates. Your security settings are where you can really lock things down. You can uh, specify uh, account lockout policy. You can specify your uh, audit policy. Auditing is covered in uh, group policies now. It's got to be enabled on the local machine. Uh, it's got to be enabled by a, an administrator. User rights uh, and security options are where you're going to do a lot of your settings. Uh, we've, uh, I've already pointed out the log on locally. You can deny log on locally. So if somebody had this uh, allow log on locally set at a different uh, GPO that applied to them, you can spe specifically deny log on locally to a group of users. So you can uh, specifically allow the administrators that you want to be able to log on to a machine and allow them and then specifically deny everybody else if uh, that's your bag. Um, you can log on locally, allow the uh, things to log on as a best job, log on as a service. Under security options here, I'm just going through these briefly. Um, additional rest restrictions for anonymous connections. So you, you can go in and specify, do not allow enumeration of SAM accounts and shares. That's kind of a good idea. No access without explicit anonymous permissions. Uh, not so bad either. So you can set the, uh, that sort of thing. You can say allow uh, server operators to schedule tasks on domain controllers, allow systems to be shut down without having to log on. Generally, you don't want that allowed on your domain controllers or your most of your servers. Um, auditing access, prompt user to change password before expiration. Uh, you can specify how long they're going to, uh, or how long before expiration they're going to get a notification. Um, secure channel using uh, digitally encrypted secure channels, uh, SMBs that have a digital signature. Um, let's see here. One of the things that I like is that you can restrict groups. How many times have you wanted to add somebody into a security group? Uh, you give them administrative permission, give them the ability to do something, and then you forget about it. You can create restricted groups where you specify who's allowed or who's in a specific group. You want to give them the ability to do something, add them to that group. The next time this group policy is processed, they're kicked out of the group. 
Okay, so you can uh, uh, boot people out of a group based on just tell the system to uh, control that. These are the people that are allowed to be in the group. If somebody else gets added to the group, I want you to remove them right away. Okay, uh, you can specify how system services are going to apply. So you can uh, specify how system services are going to uh, start up and uh, who's going to you find this uh, permission, specify which user is going to be used, and uh, select the service startup mode, automatic, manual, or disabled. So you can set those. These will override the local se uh, settings. So you can set these on a group policy that's going to apply to all, that's going to apply to all of your user clients, say at the domain level, and have uh, services start up the same across all of your client machines or all of your servers or both. Okay. Specify control over the registry. You can add in registry keys and specify uh, the permissions. So we can add in a registry key here and have that added uh, for everybody. File system permissions, you can specify a uh, specific directory on the machine and what permissions are set there. So we're going to add a file to this GPO. I'm saying, OK, for documents and settings, for example, I want everyone to have just read permission. What's that? By default, the administrator of the local machine or domain administrators can write to the registry for most of the keys. HKey local machine and HKey current user can be written. Uh, certain subtrees can be written by uh, applications and by the uh, uh, system account applications and the uh, local user. Okay, so that the user changes their desktop and that's written to the registry, things like that. Uh, public key policies, how you're going to use your uh, set of your PK, uh, PKI, and then IPsec policies. You can specify new IPsec policies and have them applied and enforced across multiple machines. Okay, so a lot of things that you can do on the local machine, you can set in group policy and have that applied across the board to a number of users. Okay, on top of all of the security, the things that we used to see in NT4 when we went into the uh, policy editor our administrative templates. We can think, do things like, uh, first of all, for Windows components, we can lock down NetMeeting, specify uh, to disable remote desktop sharing, Internet Explorer, task schedule, et cetera. Nothing really exciting in there. You can set settings on some default applications. Logon, uh, how to run logon scripts, uh, delete cache copies of roaming profiles, and how often. Uh, timeout for dialog boxes, prompt user when slow link is detected, things like that. Disk quotas, which is new for NTFS in Windows 2000, you can uh, lock down by partition, by the C drive, the D drive, et cetera, on a specific machine. Who has uh, what amount of space on that? DNS client, whether or not to specify the, uh, the primary DNS suffix. Group policy, how the group policy is going to be applied. This is going to be important once you set up group policy. How do you want group policy to be applied? How do you want it to be uh, processed? Windows file protection, something new for Windows 2000. We have Windows file protection. If you delete or try to modify specific files on the oper uh, from the operating system, from uh, system files, then it'll go in and try to restore them for you. This is where you can set how this is going to be handled. Okay, okay there we go. Set Windows file protection scanning uh, on or off. Hide the file scan progress window so uh, the user doesn't see it happening. Uh, limit Windows file protection cache size. How much of a cache is it going to allow? And specify Windows file protection cache location uh, where you're going to use it. One of the great things under, administra or under uh, our administrative templates is that every policy has an explain tab. And unlike previous versions, it's not like one sentence saying, um, this is how you specify Windows file protection cache. Okay? It gives you a couple paragraphs. Some of these are good. Some of them, you know, some are more detailed, some are less detailed, but it actually gives you an explanation of what the heck you're just about to do. Okay. The administrative templates are even more powerful for uh, users where you can do things like start menu and taskbar, remove the user's folders from the start menu, re disable and remove links to Windows Update. This is one I really like. I don't like my users going in and trying to do the Windows Update all the time. Uh, remove common program groups from start menu, remove documents from start menu, remove the run command, remove help, Add log off to the start menu. Under NT4, you could specify which applications user, users were allowed to uh, run, 
with 2000, you can specify, okay, they are allowed to run these applications, but more importantly, you can now say they're not allowed to run these. So you can put things like command.exe and cmd.exe on the do not run list. Okay, once you remove the, uh, the run prompt, uh, users try to get in and run the uh, command.exe or cmd to get a command prompt or uh, whatever they try to do. You say, okay, well, you can't run that. You can't use that. Okay, disable personalized menus. How many people are really glad personalized menus have been added to the operating system? Yeah, you can disable those for all of your users. There's nothing like a user calling you up and saying, well, I was using it yesterday, or I saw it yesterday, but now it's not on my menu. I think somebody was messing with my computer. Well, no, you have personalized menus. Click on the little chevrons at the bottom, and they're all amazed. Oh, wow, there it is. Well, I found it. So you can disable the personalized menus uh, if you are st uh, starting to see any sort of problems uh, with the personalized menus. Um, add, a, add the run and separate uh, memory space to the run box if you've got some uh, older applications. And grade the unavailable Windows installer programs, start menu shortcuts, etc. cetera. Uh, desktop, you can specify what you're going to do with the desktop. Hide the Internet Explorer icon on the desktop so that they don't go out browsing the web as easily. Hide my network places so they don't go and accidentally find something on the network or accidentally remove something from the network. Remove my documents. Do not add shares of recently opened documents. Um, disable adding, dragging, dropping, and closing the task ba uh, bars toolbars. Disable adjusting task ba desktop toolbars. This is a godsend for anybody that's had somebody accidentally lose their taskbar. You go down, they've lost it somewhere. Well, they've got it set to auto hide, and it's up on the top or over on the right hand side or what have you. Um, control. Oh, and. Underneath desktop, we can also go into active desktop and specify what they're allowed to do with active desktop and what they're allowed to do with active directory. Hide the active directory folder, enable find or uh, enable filter in the find dialog box, maximum size of active directory searches. In Windows 2000, active directory isn't just where you uh, keep your security information. Theoretically, it's going to be where you save all of your information on users and objects uh, that exist in your domain. So theoretically, you want your users searching active directory for when, they, when they're looking for a printer, when they're looking for a shared folder, or when they're looking for another user's email address, they can search Active Directory. Well, you may want to lock that down a little bit. Control panel, you can control what people are allowed to do. First of all, disable control panel for your users. Hide specified control panel applets, so only specified control panel applets. What they can do with add remove programs, what they can do with the display. Real fun trick to play with your users, go in and uh, disable all of the tabs, but not the uh, display icon. That way they can open it up, but they don't get any tabs. They, they can't actually do anything, but they still see the icon. I'm not recommending that you torture your users. I'm just saying if you wanted to, that's one way you could. Printers, you can uh, disable the deletion of printers, disable the addition of printers. Um, default Active Directory Path when searching for printers, where do you want them to look? This way you can put all of your printers in one OU, and then have the users look, okay, I'm looking for a printer. It pops up all the printers, okay? Uh, and browse a common website to find printers. We now have IPP, the Internet Printing Protocol, allows your uh, print servers to publish their printers on the web and allows your users to find them that way as well, okay? Um, under network, you can specify network and dial connections and offline files. That's something that you want to get into. Log on and log off, how you log on should, uh, and log off should run. Disable task manager, disable lock computer, disable change password on their uh, security dialog box, disable log off. Run log on scripts uh, synchronously, legacy, hidden. Run log on scripts visible, log off scripts visible. Basically, how do you want this stuff to run? Okay, then group policy, how should group policy be applied for this specific user? Okay. Does anybody have any questions so far? Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, could you dis discuss the Okay. Uh the anon you mean the anonymous enum enumeration of the uh SAM database? Yeah. Okay, hold on a second, let me get back into that.
Do you remember where I was at? This one here, additional restrictions for anonymous connections. Yeah. There you go. Um, the do not allow enumeration of SAM accounts and uh, shares. Basically, don't allow somebody to come in over the network and uh, get the SAM database, uh, read the SAM database off of uh, this server. Okay, there's a number of, uh, from what I understand, there are a number of attacks where you just go in, get the same database, and then run uh, whatever sort of password cracking, brute force attack, or whatever you want to do on the same database. Uh, so not allowing the enumeration of the same accounts and shares, not showing what same accounts and what shares are available on the server. And then the one below that, no access without explicit anonymous permissions. Um, basically, unless you have given an anonymous account permission to uh, the resource, then don't just provide the uh, the access. Does anybody else have any questions? Yeah, you in the blue hat? Go over IPsec, sure. Hold on a second. By default, IPsec, uh, there are three default settings. You've got client, which is respond only, secure server, and server. Server means it's going to request IPsec communication between itself and another uh, system. Re secure server or require security means it will not communicate unless they're using IPsec. Okay. What you want to do is you want to set client or respond only on all of your clients. If you're going to be using IPsec on your servers, you want to set all of your clients to respond only. If you don't have one of these set, then it's not going to know what to do with IPsec, and therefore it's not going to respond. Okay, so by default, your Windows 2000 clients are not going to respond to an IPsec request. It's not going to understand it, and therefore all communications from a server that's requiring IPsec are not going to occur. Or if it's just requesting IPsec, then IPsec will never be used between the two. So you need to set respond only. Basically, that means if I have a server asking me to use IPsec, then I'll respond. Okay, looking at uh, the more detailed properties of this setting is the default response rule. We go ahead and edit this. We can see that it'll use uh, using uh, triple does, uh, SHA-1, MD5. Um, default response rule simply replies to, if nothing else applies, then apply this one. And this one basically says, yeah, but you've got to use some sort of uh, security. Looking at your general information, it's going to check for policy changes every 180 minutes. So let me get back to the rules. I can add a new rule. Okay. Everything in Windows 2000 is a uh, wizard, and this is no exception. So it's a security rule wizard. Now you can go in and add something in addition to uh, the default response. We've got two different types of tunnels with IPsec. We've got end-to-end -end, uh, and point-to-point, -point, or tunnel mode and transport mode. Tunnel mode means that from this server to this server. This IPsec rule applies to uh, th between these two servers. If I specify this tunnel endpoint is specified by this IP address, then that means that if you use this rule, you have to be communicating with the server that has this IP address. So I'll put in some IP address here. Oops. Say... Uh, 10.9.8.7, just any random IP address. Now it's going to ask uh, the network type. Is this for LAN? Is this for remote access for all connections? I'm going to leave it with all connections. The authentication method. Do you want to use Kerberos? Do you want to use a certificate from a specific CA that has already been issued to you? Or do you want to use a pre-shared key? The least uh, secure of these is the pre-shared key. Basically, you both type in the same string of characters, and as long as you both have the same string of characters, then you can communicate. How do you share those characters? Well, you send them over email, or you write them down on a piece of paper, or you just tell them uh, to the person, whisper them in their ear or whatever, but you both have to have the same string. The reason that this is less secure is that if you have the pre-shared key from one end, then you have this, uh, the uh, key for both ends. Kerberos, you have to be using uh, either 
Windows 2000 servers or some uh, Unix using uh, operating in a Kerberos realm, you have to be able to use Kerberos for authentication, um, or you can use a certificate from a specific CA. Okay, um, we don't have any certificates on here. I haven't installed this as a CA, so we don't have any certificates. So let's go ahead and use a pre-shared key. Again, this is the least secure, so I wouldn't recommend this. And our pre-shared key will say hi. <laughs> really not secure. Two characters. Okay, and then uh, the filter list. What fil uh, what li what uh, protocols are we going to filter based on? Uh, do I want to go with all ICMP traffic and allow or deny it? Uh, do I want to go with all IP traffic? Okay, I'm going to actually go with all IP traffic. Based on all IP traffic, I'm going to request security. Those are my two rules. I've got the all IP traffic, which means I'm going to request security and then my dynamic. Now I've modified my uh, client uh, default policy. So we'll go ahead and say okay, uh, close. And now it's not actually just going to respond. It's got a rule in there that's going to request security. If I want to create a new policy of my own, I just right click, create IP security policy, and it gives me another one. It gives me the wizard that allows me to walk through there. I'm going to cancel out of that. You have to enable one of these in order to have uh, IPSec working. You have to at least assign client, which is respond only. These are very vague, very general policies. If you want to lock things down a little bit further, go in and create your own policy or modify these. A client is just going to respond to anything that asks for uh, IPSec communication. If you ask me for IPSec, I'll respond. I can use IPSec. I know how to do that. Server is going to request security. That means every communication is going to say, hey, how about we use IPsec? It's going to uh, propose the idea. If it doesn't get a response as far as uh, yes or no, then it'll just say, okay, well, we're not going to use IPsec, and we'll go ahead and communicate. Or if it says, yes, I'll use IPsec, and they don't, uh, they're not compatible, then they'll go ahead and communicate with IPsec. If it says, yes, I'll use IPsec, and they're compatible, then they can communicate. Secure server, which is require security, is going to, it's just that, it requires security. It's going to say, hey, let's use IPsec. If the respond or the uh, destination says, no, I don't want to use IPsec, or no, I don't understand what IPsec is, or yes, let's use IPsec, but here's my, uh, I want to use a pre-shared key, then it's going to say, sorry, no, I can't communicate. Unless we have IPsec, unless we can use IPsec, then we're not going to communicate. So uh, secure server is going to be the uh, least compatible with everybody else because it has to use IPsec in order to communicate. Server is going to try. It's going to make its best effort, but it's not going to uh, require it. Client side is respond only. Um, it's going to say, yeah, if you want to use IPsec, I'm happy to, but otherwise um, I'm happy not to as well. Does that answer your question, any on IPsec? Does anybody else have any questions? Yeah. Go ahead. Yes, yes. Microsoft is using uh, the standard on, uh, with IPsec. You can use a uh, any sort of Kerberos, whether you're working with Kerberos Realm. You can also use certificates, okay, or a pre-shared key, and it'll work with uh, hardware-based IPsec or uh, other implementations. It's not a Microsoft-specific or proprietary version of IPsec. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, say that again? Um, I don't know. I'm imagining it's uh, the uh, iUser or iWAM, but I, I don't know that specifically. Yeah, go ahead. Those are uh, installed with double IS. Those allow anonymous access. So when you go to the web server with your client, it's basically coming in using uh, one of those accounts, depending on the type of access that you're asking for from the IIS server. Go ahead. Are there any command line utilities for what? For group policy modification? Um, the, you can modify your group policy using uh, command line. I think there's a, a tool in the resource kit that allows you to go in and create a group policy. 
Um, you can uh, do a lot of things with Active Directory. You can modify a lot of things in Active Directory using uh, basic LDAP queries and LDAP uh, modification. Um, and there's a number of tools in the uh, resource kit, uh, the 2000 resource kit, that help you to do. They're trying to get everything uh, to be, well, as far as I can tell, they're trying to uh, get it to the point where you can use a command line to do a lot of this stuff. So, yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Um, one thing I would do, I would, I would go in and create a, a template, security template, and then apply that to all of your uh, workstations, that's going to save you a little bit of time because now you can just say, okay, this is the level of security we want, and it's like stamping it on every workstation. That'll save you some time from having to go in and modify it. Um, without Active Directory, there are a lot of the capabilities of uh, new, uh, Windows 2000, a lot of the new great stuff is because Active Directory allows you to do blah, blah, blah. Um, Hardware compatibility, plug and play. Be aware that Windows 2000 is plug and play compatible and NT4 wasn't, um, and all the implications of that. Um, as far as best practices, I would uh, treat them mostly like NT workstations with the compatibility of hardware and applications of uh, 98. Now, know that 2000 out of the box is more secure and more restrictive than NT was. So applications that worked under NT may not work under 2000. Um, for the most part, I mean, if, if you're rolling the dice and it's 95 or NT, it's going to be a lot more compatible with applications that were compatible under NT. There's just some applications that uh, wrote to other registry keys that 2000 is not going to allow anymore, uh, subtrees or subkeys of uh, HKLM and HK current user that 2000 is not going to allow. So just be careful with that. I would, uh, have you done testing yet with your applications? I'd get a 2000 box and do testing and see how the applications run. You're most likely going to be able to run most of your applications with 2000, if not all of them. But uh, just be aware that there are some change, some differences, so it's not going to be as smooth as you'd like it to be, or it may not be. What's that? There's problems with CAD tools with 2000. Do you have any specific CAD tools? AutoCAD? Okay, so do you use AutoCAD at all? No? Okay. Uh, you may want to be aware of that. Yeah, go ahead. With what? Right. Yeah, that's another thing is that if you're managing your uh, 2,000 professional clients, you can get the administration tools off the uh, CD and install them on your NT uh, box. So if you're running NT on your workstation, you can throw the administration tools on there and still administer uh, the different uh, desktops around your uh, client. You can add in, you can create an MMC and have computer management and disk management for uh, all of your client desktops. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, he was, he was saying that uh, as an administrator, you install an application, the user goes in to use it, and they can't, it won't run because you installed it under administrative credentials. Is that what you're asking? And how do you, how do you get around that? Um, you can make the user a member of the administrator's group temporarily. Uh, you log on as them, install the application. A lot of times it's just uh, user account mapping that uh, is a problem if it's... Uh, if that doesn't work for you, obviously editing the registry, which is a big pain in the tail side. Um, yeah, go ahead. The group policy management. Yeah, you you can install Active Directory users and computers. Um, basically, go to the uh, Windows 2000 Server CD, Server Advanced Server CD, and uh, there's an admin pack that MSI in the i386 directory. Install that, and that'll give you all of the tools. All the MMC, MMC snap-ins plus uh, a number of other tools that aren't specifically snap-ins.
Go ahead. Yeah, you. Yeah, that's a good point. It's easier if you need to edit the registry for a number of users. We were looking at the group policy, the uh, GPO. You can actually modify the registry in the GPO and then apply that GPO to a number of users. You can actually go out and uh, download GPOs that will give you compatibility with legacy applications. Yeah, thank you. That's a good point. Go ahead. I don't know. Sorry. Go ahead. Is there any downside to using a server as your administrator console so that you have all the tools that need to be there? I don't see any reason not to. As long as, I mean, just traffic or uh, traffic and uh, workload. I mean, if you're running uh, 20 applications and switching between them and you're also using that as your only domain controller, then obviously you're going to run into issues. But Oh yeah, I mean, other than licensing issues, it's going to cost you more. And uh, having the tool, you, you'll have the tools available uh, just by take the uh, install professional on your machine, take the tools from the uh, CD and throw them on there. You're going to have all of the tools. If you really need to work directly on the server, then throw terminal server on some of your file and print servers uh, under administrative uh, control mode. You go in and you can you have two sessions that can only be used by an administrator. And then just open up a terminal session, and you've got the de the server desktop on your desktop. So, as far as uh, co it's going to cost you more to have server on your desktop, but if that's not an issue, then go ahead and try it. But uh, you get all the tools on a professional machine or even on an NT machine theoretically. So there's not really a need to. But if you find a need to, I don't see any downside to it, other than the cost. Any other questions? Yeah. Right. For the page file, yeah. Right. You'll also run into problems if you've already if you already have. He was saying uh, that he's run into problems. He removed the everyone full control from C, and then it wouldn't give him permission to the page file, and he had to go in and add system. You'll also run into problems if you already have users who have logged into that machine under documents and settings. If you remove the everyone full control, uh, they may not be able to. Uh, Access the system because they now they are lose access to uh, the uh, documents and settings, which uh, is where their profile starts. So they can't log on because of that. So uh, when you remove the everyone full control from C drive, you need to go in and do a little bit of tweaking, add the system account to a couple places, and add authenticated users uh, to a couple places to give access that way. Yeah, go ahead. So what you're saying is that you uh, created the policy, it applied just fine, you modified the policy, and the modifications didn't go down. Um, I've heard of uh, that happening before. It, I've also heard of it not happening, so I'm not sure. Does anybody know what the, what he's running into there? Yeah, I'd be happy to. He was saying that uh, what he's okay. <laughs> okay. Anybody else have any questions?
No other questions? Anything else you guys want to know about Windows 2000? Any curiosities, questions? I mean, we've got another 20 minutes here. Yeah, go ahead. Um, he asked, uh, what's my experience with the encrypted file system? I've used it a little bit, and uh, to be honest with you, it scares me a little bit because users can just go in and encrypt a file. Um, theoretically, the domain administrator is the uh, recovery agent, the default recovery agent for the uh, encrypted file system. I've had 2,000 professional machines where I've gone in and uh, set it up, and the local administrator account was not the uh, recovery agent, but I was still able to, I just had a random user account, and I was able to encrypt the files. Um, the local administrator account was not the default recover, the recovery agent. I went and looked for that. I couldn't find uh, that anywhere, so I'm not sure how that was working. Um, I've also heard people talk about uh, using EFS. Uh, user leaves, you delete their account. Yeah, the uh, administrator account is by default the uh, recovery agent, and the recovery agent can go in and recover it, but it's uh, sort of a technically possible but logistically hell to go in and recover files that a user has encrypted and then uh, you can't re uh, recover from that. As far as working, I have uh, yet to find a file that I wasn't able to recover when working with it. I've uh, not heard of anybody talking about they couldn't recover a file uh, eventually. Um, it's just more of a logistically doesn't work as well as uh, you'd like it to. Any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Um, for locking down a Windows 2000 system, not specifically for locking down a Windows 2000 system, I would recommend if you're uh, just starting out with a 2000 uh, server or even if you've been working with it for a while, uh, Mark Manassi wrote a book, uh, Mastering Windows 2000 Server. I think it's in like fifth edition now. Um, he basically just goes through and goes, okay, listen, this is how it is. This is how it works as far as I understand it. He's been doing this since, since I believe, uh, NT351, even possibly before that. He did a version for NT4. He's got a uh, newsletter. You can go to manassi.com and find out all sorts of updates of little security holes that people have found, uh, problems people have found with advanced server. Uh, I'm sorry, with, not with advanced server, well, with advanced server, but with Active Directory, things like that. And it's sort of a plain language, hey, this is how I see it with uh, 2000. And it's from somebody that's been working with this stuff, understands it at a much more molecular level. Uh, than most, and so therefore has some pretty good insights from what I've seen. He, he's pointed things out that I haven't found elsewhere. So, uh, I'm sorry? Um, Manassi.com, M-I-N-A-S-I.com, uh, and it's by Mark Manassi. You can also, uh, a little hint, if you go to lcis.booksonline.com, you can order, he's got a, uh, it's called the Mark Manassi uh, resource kit, and it's got Mastering 2000 Advanced Server, Mastering Active Directory, Mastering Professional. You can get that as a kit for 10 bucks, and then you have to order one more book, and then you can quit the club. So you get it's uh, like a $140 set of books, and you get it for 10 bucks. Order another book for 20 bucks. What's that? It's LCIS, uh, Library of Computer Information Services, or Library of Computer Information Science, dot booksonline.com. And then you can order the, there's a couple different sets of books that you can get for 10 bucks to join the club. It's sort of like a Columbia House type of thing where you order the books and then they keep sending you update cards. They screwed you? <laughs> okay, so be careful because they might screw you because they screwed that guy. Um, they send me my kit real quick, and then they keep sending me the cards. They just keep saying, no, thank you right now. I eventually have to buy a book and quit the club because I don't really want these cards coming every month, but I haven't gotten around to that yet. So I haven't ha actually ordered anything from beyond that, but I got the kit, and uh, it was pretty good. Wait, you got to yell, though, so. Any problems with replication? Uh, do bears shit in the woods? Yeah, there's, uh, there's uh, talk of with 2002... Um, there's talk of limiting it to, I think, two domain controllers per location or something like that. They lifted that because uh, it was going to cause all sorts of other problems. As far as compared to uh, 2000, the replication file replication service from uh, in Windows 2000 is a lot better 
then uh, replication in NT4. The, act, the domain controllers replicate uh, pretty well unless you have a slow link between them or unless you go in and try uh, screwing around with the replication topology. There's something called the KCC, the Knowledge Consistency Checker. Um, goes in and checks the uh, replication, makes sure that every domain controller replicates with every other domain controller within three hops. It's not always perfect, um, but it's a lot better than if you go in and create a whole bunch of connections yourself, because you create those connections yourself and then things change. It's not going to challenge that. Go ahead. Hold on one second. I can't hear you. How do you replace your switch with a hub? <laughs> he says when uh, he uh, set his uh, Microsoft had him replace the switch with a hub. If anything, I think they would go, have you go the opposite direction. I, it's Microsoft. I'm sure they knew what they were doing, and they had logical reason for doing it. <laughs> Any other questions? What's that? It's at three? Really? Yeah. Yeah, NT is further up, I knew, but I thought I had. Did it? Okay, I, was, I must be thinking of something else because I thought I had three and I thought they had two more. Maybe I had one and they came out with two more after that. Go ahead. To be honest with you, I just got lucky. I put the CD in and it worked. Yeah. Yeah. Now, it took me a while, and you've got to have patience. And actually, I didn't have uh, a, a crossover cable or a, a terminated cable. And in order to install Active Directory, it has to recognize network uh, as being there. It doesn't actually have to be able to communicate with anything, but it has to recognize that a network is there. And so what I did is I created a VPN to itself set it up a VPN server and a VPN client, had a VPN into itself to 127.001. Then it had a network, and then I was able to install Active Directory just fine. So if you're ever setting it up on a laptop and you want to do that, that's something I figured out like Friday night when I was on the plane, or Thursday night when I was on the plane. Any other questions? Go ahead. Take you through what? NAT, uh, the network address translation? Okay, I wasn't sure if you were saying NAT or DAT. So yeah, no, that's no problem. Let me get out of all of this. It's actually pretty easy to uh, install NAT on 2000. Um, I don't have two network connections, so I'm not going to be able to walk you all the way through it. But let's see how far we can get. We're going to go into routing and remote access. Here, what we're doing is we're installing uh, network address translation services. Specify the server. And now just for fun, I'm going to do this a long way. We'll go and configure and enable routing remote access. Now I could just say... Uh, set it up as a internet connection server. I'm going to start to walk through this and then I'm going to back out. Say set it up as a NAT server. Actually, I'll, here I'll do it both ways. Set up the router with router uh, with network address translation. Specify the internet connection. Actually, here I'll create a demand, new dem demand dollar internet connection. You chose to create a demand dial connection to start the demand dial interface wizard. Blah, blah, blah. Let's hurry up and create this. I love that everything in Windows 2000 can be done with a wizard because you don't have to think so much. And that way you can uh, think about other things like how to surf or where to surf. Just kidding. What's that?
Also, if anybody knows how to repair an internal modem, I uh, busted mine. So, dialog credentials. Okay, this is this is the the best account to use for this. Okay, so now I've got a NAT server set up that way. Go into routing, NAT, and here we see our remote router is the internet and the local area connection is my local. That's the easy way if you're not using anything else. But if you're already using router remote access on your server, you can't just walk through that wizard as easily. So I'm going to set it up as if we already have it set up as a general router, and then I'll show you how to set up that. It's actually really easy. It's just a little bit different. Okay, so configure and enable routing remote access server. Um, manually configured server there. There we go. Finish. It's not going to have anything. Start the service. Oh, by the way, if you have a laptop and uh, you don't like the mouse on there, this thing's really cool. It's a handheld mouse. The uh, roller ball's on top with your thumb, and then your trigger finger is a left click, and then you've got a left click and right click on there. So I, just, I like it, so I just figured I'd tell you guys about it. Um, I don't even know who makes it. I got mine at cyberguys.com, I think. It's like 10 bucks or 20 bucks. It's not even that bad as far as my are concerned. It's about the cost of a mouse. So, um, so we're going to IP routing here. Go to general. Say new routing protocol. Everybody with me so far? OK, so new routing protocol. Network address translation, I'll say OK. I then go into NAT, say new interface, specify the local area connection, and say, okay, this is my private interface to the private network. I would then, and this is the part I'm not going to be able to do, I would then go in, say new interface, and select my external interfaces going out to the internet. Once I have that configured, actually, let me change this to my public interface. I'm going to tell it to translate TCP UDP headers. And I'm going to specify the address pool from which it can choose. This is the external addresses. Uh, any reservations? Need to have a range before you have a reservation. Okay, so I'll put in Okay, so these are the range. I've got a class C, for example, um, 1 through 254. Reservations I can reserve. And I'm saying, okay, um, 192, 168, what was it, 76.10 maps to one specific computer on the internal network. So I'll say 10.9.8.7. Allow incoming sessions to this address. That means anything that you receive on the NAT server for this specific IP address will be redirected to this specific internal server. So you can redirect an entire address from your address pool, or if you only have one address, or if you have multiple addresses but you only want to re redirect one port, you can go in and say special ports. I want to redirect, say, TCP port 80 to this port on this server. So your NAT server can handle you know, your incoming SMTP, your POP3, your uh, IMAP, your HTTP requests, and redirect those to a specific internal server without exposing its uh, port or, its, uh, more importantly, its internal IP address out uh, to the external network or to the Internet. 
Any other questions? Good. Um, yeah, it's, it's really easy to set up. On your home machine, if you're running 2000 on your home machine, you go into settings, to network and dial up connections, make new connection, and it'll just walk you through. I mean, it's a wizard again. So uh, connect to a private network. This is, again, if you're running 2000, if you're running another operating system, then obviously it wouldn't be the same. Okay. Um, Specify how you're going to connect, whether you're dialing up or whether you're going over uh, the internet. Specify an IP address. Specify a host name there. For all users, or only for myself. If it's for all users, then anybody that logs on can use it. If it's only for myself, then only I can use it when I log on. Enable internet connection sharing. This enables other computers on my homeland to connect through it to the network through me. If I don't enable that, then I'm the only one that can use this connection. Uh, if you do, it's going to ask you if you want to enable on-demand dialing, and it'll reset the uh, port, your local interface, to 192.168.0.1, and then hand out IP addresses. It'll try to hand out IP addresses to everybody else on your network. You can go in and just disable that, change it back to whatever you had it, but it'll do that by default. And then it'll try to dial. Okay. Set up a VPN server through routing remote access uh, at work. Very straightforward. I've, uh, I haven't done it from home to work yet because I don't have anything to do at work. I mean, I'm a teacher. I'm in the classroom all the time. So, um, but I've set it up in classroom environments and in test labs, and it was real simple. So, um, yeah, I believe so. Yeah. yeah. The the browser service might not work as well that way. In other words, you wouldn't be able to use network neighborhood. But if you knew the path, then you'd be able to use a UNC path. Any other questions? Um, actually, I don't. Um, you can, I mean, I do have an email address, but it's my, I think. You can email me at uh, don't ask, D O N T A S K, at rocketmail.com. If you have any comments or questions or, uh, as a matter of fact, if anybody that wants a copy of my slide presentation, again, it was kind of brief, so you may not, but if you do want a copy of it, send me an email, again, at don't ask, D-O-N-T-A-S-K, at rocketmail, like rocket, like <laughs> mail, dot com, and I'll be happy to email you this slide presentation, or a facsimile thereof. If I lose it, I'll recreate it real quick. Uh, yeah, go ahead. The uh, built-in packet filtering, you can just go in and uh, set up. I'm not sure how robust it is or how uh, reliable it is. I haven't had uh, any opportunity to really put it through its paces. I know uh, when I've set up uh, filtering in the past, it hasn't, uh, and somebody's run a uh, port scan against me, it still, still shows those ports as available, but they haven't been able to connect over them. I'm sorry? I didn't notice such, but it, I mean, we were just playing around with it. I haven't had a chance to really put it through its paces. So, and to set it up, you just go into advanced TCP IP properties. To TCP IP filtering, to properties, and you specify what you're going to filter. How do you mean? Um, right, no. Permit only, yeah, no, it's, you can't block just like one port using this. Your best bet if you just want to block ports, just firewall. There's a ton of, you can get a, what's that one that's free? Um, Zone alarm. You can get zone alarm for free, uh, and it works pretty well. You can just there's a button on there. You click and say block everything. And it's not the absolute most secure.
fire all, but it's better than what you've got now if you don't have anything. Any other questions? Okay, let's all flee. Oh, yeah, go ahead. IPsec will not go through NAT. So yeah, if you're using IPsec, you have to go to NAT, to the NAT server, and then you can either you can have NAT up to the server, and then a separate, uh, or IPsec up to the NAT server, and then a separate IPsec connection from the NAT server on, but IPsec won't go through NAT because you can't do the translation. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's there's probably products out there. Uh, it won't go through Microsoft's implementation of NAT. Um, but again, you can go up to the NAT server and then IPsec from there, but that can be kind of a hassle. So, any other questions? Okay, let's all flee from the, for the air conditioning of the indoors. Thank you. Again, if you have any questions or... Uh